Okay. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Yes, it's a webinar where we cover anything that may be of uh, interest to librarians um, across Nebraska sometimes and across the whole country, uh, depending on what our topic of the week is. Um, we do these sessions live every Wednesday morning at <laughs> 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, and uh, so you can join us on Wednesday mornings, but they are all recorded. So if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. You can always go and um, watch all of the recordings that we might ha that we have available out there for you. Uh, we have commission staff that do presentations here, so we present our own things, and we sometimes bring in guest speakers, as we have this morning. Um, this morning, we actually have um, part two of a session of a series that we're doing. Uh, Karen Keir is from the Nebraska State uh, Historical Society, and two weeks ago, mm -hmm. two weeks ago, two yeah, weeks ago. <laughs> we did part one of the digital preservation um, session. And uh, we're on to part two this week, and then two weeks from now, the first week in March, will be part three, the wrap-up of um, going through all this. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'll just hand over to Karen to go ahead and take it away for Thank this you. section. Um, as Krista said, my name is Karen Keir, and I am the photograph curator at the Nebraska State Historical Society. And part of my job duties is I'm also in charge of the digital imaging lab there. Um, so this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart because as we make all these amazing digital images, I want to make sure that they are available to the public and preserved for um, a number of years to go ahead. Um, so uh, first off, I just um, if I break into a coughing fit, I like to apologize ahead of time. I seem to have caught a bit of a cold, so um, we'll muddle through this. Um, but I want to thank the Nebraska Libraries uh, Commission for giving us this opportunity to present these um, webinars. Um, on the importance of digital preservation and um, and how to create a and manage a plan to uh, protect your digital content. The mouse or try the arrow keys or space bar key. Let's see here. Let's okay, let's try the mouse. Right, there we go. Again, yeah. So today we're just going to go over a little bit of introductions. Um, I'm trying not, I'm not going to spend too much time going over what we talked about last week about digital content and stuff. The recording um, for that one is already available for online. the whole session that we did the first part online on the Encompass Live website, so you can always go back and watch that to catch up. Yes. Yeah. Um, so mostly we're going to con uh, concentrate on um, our uh, store models and the, the protect model uh, as part of the depot training um, model uh, method. Um, this, I was encouraged to go to this training um, through the Husker Heritage Network. Uh, the, the Nebraska State Historical Society recently received a grant to set up, help set up this um, uh, network. We're in the planning stages right now, so keep an uh, eye out for more training opportunities for collection caretakers, um, which will include emergency preparedness, which we'll talk a little bit about today, and care paper materials as well. So if you'd like more information, um, please visit our website, the Nebraska History, um, Nebraska State Historical Society's website, which is nebraskahistory.org, or the Saving Treasures website, which um, also has some great information on it, too, about that. So uh, what Depot is, is, um, is a training session through the Library of Congress's Digital Preservation Outreach and um, Education. I attended a Train the Trainer workshop um, in August. Um, and the idea from the Library of Congress is, is they've came up with this great model to help preserve digital content. And in order to get it out, um, it wasn't, they couldn't figure out a way to get it to as many um, institutions as, as possible. So their idea was is that um, they'll train trainers in every state. And then these trainers will then be responsible for, for presenting these models to, um, to everybody. We had a wonderful... Um, training session in Indianapolis where I learned lots and lots of information. Um, so hopefully I've retained everything and, and <laughs> going to present it to you today, um, at least on the two bottles we're talking about. So the Dep Depot's mission is to, um, it's to foster national outreach and encourage um, individuals and organizations to actively preserve their digital content. Um, and doing this through a collaborative network of instructors, contributors, and institutional partners. Um, and today, when we're talking about um, STORE, you'll see why that collaborative um, collaboration is going to be so important. 
So what is digital preservation? Um, it is the active management of digital content over time to ensure its ongoing access. Once a physical item has been digitized or a digital item has been created, you can't just put it on a shelf and expect that in 50 years from now you're going to be able to open it. We know that um, media goes obsolete, files go obsolete, files become corrupt. So this is, um, we need to come up with a plan in order to be able to access that information in the future. <clears throat> so we put in a lot of time and effort. So what the um, Library of Congress has developed is this, um, these models, these um, six modules um, that help break down this planning session into six easy to follow steps. Um, we talked about identify um, how, through how to identify your um, digital content through an inventory and how to select what the most important content will be to preserve and manage over time. So today we're going to talk about long-term storage and how to protect that from both minor and major disasters. And then on March 6th will be the last of the three-part digital preservation series um, and we'll be covering how to create a, um, provisions for long-term management um, and then the types of consideration, considerations that will be for um, long-term access. Um, so this is one of the, the uh, slides that I used last time as well, and I think it's a really nice thing. It shows how all six of these models build together and work together um, in order to help uh, maintain, manage, and protect and provide access to your, um, your uh, digital content. <clears throat> Okay. Did I just go backwards? No, no, I skipped a slide. There we go. That's why. Okay, so let's move on and start talking about um, the store model module of the digital preservation. Storage is um, is not digital preservation, but it's also not not digital preservation. So um, I know that's a little confusing, but I think as we go through this, you'll understand what I mean. So what? Um, so what is storage in the context of digital preservation? It's important to understand that backup and storage is not synonymous. Digital content that has been selected for preservation needs to be stored in ways that align with good practices. While system backups may be um, part of the preservation strategy, strategy, a backup is primarily intended to restore an entire system if it crashes, um, and that includes all of the resident. Uh, files. <clears throat> Preservation, on the other hand, treats a file individually and seeks to care for that the content of those individual files forever, or however long that is. Common practice is to store content in um, a format that is ideal, that ideally is not software dependent, uncompressed, and unencrypted. Um, this content or, or the file may be in a variety of forms, whether it be text, video, or images, and it has been identified and described, um, which is where the metadata fit, piece fits into the preservation puzzle. The, the file plus its corresponding description is often referred to as the digital object. So when I'm talking about the digital object throughout this presentation, um, that's what I'm talking about, not only the file, whether it be TIFF or video, but also the metadata that goes together. Um, and the, for preservation storage purposes, you will need at least two copies stored in two different locations. It's important to start with the basics. No software or system is going to make up for, make up for digital content that hasn't been prepared well enough for preservation. It should matter what the digital what, what the object contains, but um, it does. It shouldn't matter what the matter uh, what the object contains, but it does. We have strategies that work well for specific types of data, for specific types of file formats, for example. Each institution will define the baseline for their metadata based on the needs and their resources. But you must have enough metadata to be able to identify the characteristics, the, characteristics, the provenance, um, and the provenance of the digital object in order for it to ensure its viability. When possible, use common file formats and keep track of where your content is stored and who has access to it. 
you want to store multiple copies in at least two locations. And I'm going to say that over and over today. Simply managing well-formatted files in um, association with metadata to manage it and use it is a big step towards good practice. All right, so I don't know about you, but every time I say the word metadata, I actually cringe a little bit inside. <laughs> um, I'm not a librarian, so metadata is not a natural thing for me. I'm a, uh, you know, a historian and a uh, curator, so uh, <clears throat> sometimes I'm a little out of my element talking about metadata. Um, but all metadata really is is data about data. Um, because, after all, a digital file is really, in its essence, just a string of numbers, zeros, and ones. Um, and then it's, it's translated from a computer to, and a, by the computer and a software program. Metadata is what makes that digital file understandable to humans. It tells us what the object is, how it can be used, um, how we can use that object in the future, and it allows us to track, trace that object over time. So when I say that storage is not digital preservation, um, that's because storage doesn't always take into account the importance of metadata, um, which is what really enables long-term preservation. Metadata is essential for preservation. The community has identified it, identified no single, very um, no single, very specific definition of preservation metadata. It does, however, include all the information needed to manage, find, and use digital content over time. And what that exactly means is open to discussion. Um, there is some basic steps to gain control of, of digital content using meta metadata. For example, um, how do you document exactly what an object is? And what is the content for that use? <clears throat> or the content, context, sorry, context for that use? And what will the future generations need to know to be able to both access and efficiently make use of that item? In the digital world, um, versions and copies are easy to make. Um, how do you know, how do you verify that this object is authentic and unchanged over time? All those questions and more are answered by metadata. I do have a question. Yes. Um, not about metadata. Oh, thank though, goodness. <laughs> um, about the two copies thing. It's just yes. a push a computer. And we'll but, talk about that a little bit more later on, mm -hmm. but yes. Um, you want to know, does two copies in two locations mean two copies in one place and two copies in another? So four in total or just one in each place and two? What they're saying total. is is a minimum of two copies. So one in one location, probably mm -hmm. your server on site, mm -hmm. and then another copy um, on a, an, an another, in another location. Um, and this can be where the collaboration comes in. So it could be um, if you're working with the Library Commission, you would keep a copy mm -hmm. of our metadata or our digital yeah, content, right. and we would keep a copy of your right. meta digital content. Everybody, so it's two separate locations. Mm -hmm. You know, here, we're here in Nebraska, so um, we are in tornado land. <laughs> yes. So think of, um, you know, what would happen if your building was wiped out by a tornado and your servers were taken out by a tornado. Somewhere separate from there that you still have a, that digital object. Exactly. Yeah. So we'll talk more about um, the possibility of, you know, collaborations and cloud storage later on in the um, program. So thanks. Okay. Um, so a great example of metadata is um, from iTunes. Mm -hmm. huh? I think most of us have um, an iTunes account or some sort of video or um, music account. So your I um, <clears throat> that it, it's easy to relate to. So your iTunes library doesn't really contain MP3 as um, those files are stored elsewhere on your computer. Your iTunes library contains the metadata about each of those um, MP3 files and a link to that file. Um, and that metadata tells you what that file is so that you, um, so for an example, uh, so in this example, my MP3 file is a podcast. And the information attached to the file tells me the name of the show, the artist, the album, and the year that it was produced. And depending on what that file is, um, it may also have a composer and a um, general uh, and, and um, a track number too. But that's basic, that's the basic idea of the metadata. And easier to relate to. Metadata um, gets added to for all uh, added to all kinds of files, and you probably are not even aware of it. So on the left is a uh, metadata for a um, Word document, um, and uh, 
And then the other one is for a JPEG just downloaded from the internet. So it shows um, how metadata is often generated without or even without even realizing it, um, and how it's a file attached to a um, to another file, basically. And it's that package of information that's important to preserve. Okay. So it's important to remember that in order to preserve a digital object, you're going to need um, more than a descriptive aspect of the metadata. That information is very important in the library world. So it is what we're most um, familiar with. We catalog things and add uh, subject terms to it, and we find or we write finding aids. But there are other types of metadata that we need to be aware of um, when thinking about preservation. Where does that object come from? How can I use it? How does it relate to other digital items in our collection? Uh, what kind of file is it? And uh, is this file unchanged from when it was received? Um, consider briefly what administrative metadata you may need. For example, um, you'll probably want to track what formats your content is in so that we can find that content that needs to be migrated to um, formats before it becomes obsolete. Administrative metadata usually includes technical information about that format, also so that also so migration to newer formats can be um, as effective as um, as possible. Structural metadata is primarily for um, digital objects which have multiple parts, um, such as a 50-page um, pamphlet. Future users will need to be able to determine what um, the order is for delivery how the files relate to each other, and what is uh, described by metadata. Descriptive metadata um, is what we're most familiar with. It is the information that, is, that describes the item, um, provides context, and enables us to use the item efficiently. Above and beyond um, these three, preservation uh, metadata usually includes uh, verification that the original is unchanged, that the, a document trail of everything done to this object over time, a unique identification for the item within your system, and any necessary contextual information beyond that um, that is already in the description. <coughs> Excuse me. Over time, it's necessary to know what the primary primary substance of your context is. Knowing if it's a tip. Um, doesn't tell you if the content is primary textual or image. Um, yet, uh, when it comes time to migrate it to newer formats, you may have to choose the new format based on whether it's important to preserve the text or the image displayed. Um, to preserve the substance of the object, you need to know its context. Uh, fixivity is a term based on a uh, term used to verify the object is unchanged. Um, MD5 checksums uh, taken at the time of the deposit and checked on a raise, uh, regular basis um, serve to ensure that fixivity is um, the content, the fixivity of the content. Uh, reference is how you uh, refer to an item within your repository. Each object needs to have its unique identifier. Um, in the museum world, we use um, object identification numbers for each mm -hmm. object, so we use that as our um, object ID. That's something right. you can just make up your own system. Yes. For. Yes. And the content is, context is um, necessary so that others um, in the future can make sense of this object and how it's going to be re used. Remember, um, what you will get out of storage is only as good as what you put in. Objects need to be pre prepared for preservation. <clears throat> All right, so how many copies is enough? In a minimum, you need two copies in two locations. Optimum is six copies. Wow. Yeah. In addition to metadata, digital preservation requires multiple copies. Has anyone ever heard of the acronym um, uh, LOCKS? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have. Yes. Um, and that's L-O-C-K-S-S, -S -S, which I should have put on the screen and forgot. Um, it means lots of copies keep stuff safe. And it's the name of the open source library-led digital, digital um, preservation system 
built on the principle that lots of copies keep stuff safe. In the digital preservation world, the most often cited number of, sort of copies to be managed for your preservation is six. But your organization will need to decide how many copies you think is sufficient to preserve your content. As long as there's at least two, optimally in different location, storage is cheap. Storage is cheap and um, getting cheaper by the day, but it's still not free. So um, as you are storing large video files, for example, it might not be worth it to have six, six copies. A lot of people are storing files in the cloud. Um, all that means is that you're taking advantage of that shared network in infrastructure um, so that you are not managing every server where your content resides. Um, anytime that you email a file to yourself, as well as saving a copy to your hard drive or um, a server, you're creating an extra copy that is stored in another location. So like this preservation, this, co this um, presentation, I have stored on um, probably six different locations because I was a little paranoid about <laughs> <laughs> the weather this today. And I want to be able to... to me. I've got... Ed said yes. It's in my... It's in at least two places right here. Yes, in my right yes. I can tell you that. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So many organizations have um, a set of high-resolution images stored on, on gold CDs. Um, as an, as an artifact from when offline storage was good practice because that's what um, the possible technology was and it was affordable. However, the community has moved away from offline storage like CDs and, and DVDs as a good option for preservation. Um, for us, it became there were just so many CDs that we were taking up shelf space that should have been for artifacts. Um, so there, so um, there are now hosted services and collaborative groups um, such as Meta, um, Meta Archives that organizations can join to meet their preservation obligations. It's also necessary to make comparisons um, to make good decisions. Most important, it is, um, for you, most important for you to know is what you have. Understand the resources and options available to you and make the best decisions you can knowing that technology will continue to change and um, what it is, uh, and with it your possible options and requirements. <clears throat> storage partners are um, trusted institutions that agree to work together by storing content for each other. Um, a service agreement is usually defined so that each partner knows what to expect and to avoid and to avoid um, liability concerns um, and, and other aspects. Um, one, as, one example is the APN Net um, and another is the Meta Archive, uh, which I'm sure you guys can find more information about or maybe already know more information about. Um, should you decide to use a service that relies on cloud computing, here's a brief um, definition. Cloud computing relies on shared computing resources, whether having local server servers or personal devices that can handle um, applications. Cloud computing now um, applies to large-scale computing, such as um, supercomputing or grid computing, to deliver personalized information and services to organizations and individuals. Um, to do this, cloud computing networks, um, large scale groups of servers, and others with um, low cost um, computer PC technology with specialized connections through high speed data processing um, tours across them. So it's like you, you have your information stored on um, an endless number of servers that all work together to um, link together. Um, just be careful to read the fine prints for these services. Most preservation services ensure that there they have no liability should your content become compromised, damaged, or lost. Um, and if they don't get a payment on time, you may lose your content. So read the small print. Uh, many larger institutions use uh, repositories to handle their storage and preservation. There are, a number, uh, there are multiple repository form formats out there from open source to proprietary um, 
but no one system will be able to do everything. It's important to remember, um, it's, the important thing is to remember that you're choosing a repository system that um, even the free open source ones come with costs. And at some point, you're going to want to move your content to somewhere else. So what you want to make sure is that it's easy to take content out as it is to put in. If you decide to implement repository software to manage your digital content, be, intent about, um, be intentional about what you do. Figure out your requirements and determine whether the option you're considering will work for 80, 60 to 80% of what you want to archive. Um, here, are the, here are some aspects you might want to consider when choosing your, your repository. Will it manage all of your content or only certain formats? Is it easy to use? How well supported is it? Um, uh, is it and likely to be over the years to come? Um, many repository systems claim to be compliant to standards. Usually that means that it can map um, its functionality to basic modules of OASIS or um, the guidelines for open archival information systems. Um, most systems can take the take in content as well uh, well enough um, and get it back out. Um, and they may uh, try to cover a full range of policies and procedures, um, but usually fail. Uh, another area that systems oversimplify are preservation planning. There's often not significant support for managing content over time. For example, managing content before or um, and after a migration from one file format to another. Um, but choose the best object option for the present and be sure that you can receive it, retrieve it in your content in full because over time it is likely that better options will emerge. There are a growing number of, of, um, of available um, solutions. Um, some for specific uh, types of material, um, like locks and um, portico. Um, and then there are ones for specific um, locations. Um, some of these are examples of open source software, um, and some of them are black box vendor solutions for, um, a vera uh, for varying degrees of openness. Um, about how they will work. Uh, some are library community hosted solutions and some have full-fledgling collaborative um, solutions. But again, um, it's up to you to find what is going to work best for your institution. Just know that there are a lot of things out there for you to choose from. So um, do what we do best, which is research. <laughs> <clears throat> um, there are now hosted services and collaborative groups um, uh, that organizations can enjoy to meet their preservation obligations. It's necessary for organizations to compare, um, to, compare uh, to make a good decision. The community has moved away from offline storage. Um, oh, I think I have this in there twice. See, I did miss this one. Okay. We can fix that. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, a slide in there twice. That's what I get for moving things around. <laughs> okay, um, so in this module, uh, we've discussed the difference between backup and preservation, um, that digital content is comprised of files with their associated metadata, and that these elements were taken together to, uh, taken, that these elements taken together are referred to as digital content. We noted that the importance of um, at making at least two copies in two different locations and the need to utilize common file formats whenever possible. We have learned the importance of metadata and how it uniquely identifies the object and establishes their um, authenticity. Um, it is the metadata that tells us the life story of the digital content. Um, we've explored storage options, whether online, nearline, or offline, um, and things to consider when choosing the appropriate solution for your institution. However, there is no one perfect solution for all content or for every institution. Um, it is important to, rem um, to remain flexible and keep, your mind, and keep in mind that those constructs um, upon which you base your identification and selection of your um, collections for preservation in the first place. 
you uh, may need to employ uh, more than one solution. Um, for the State Historical Society, our video files, our video preservation files are very, very large um, and they are treated separately from our um, digital images collection. So. <clears throat> Uh, the result of um, addressing these storage issues is that your institution will develop a storage management policy um, and how, so how many copies will you store and where. Um, how will you verify that the files do not change over time? Um, you will need to identify the storage services or partner agreements and ensure that you have a system in place to monitor those copies for errors and change. You also need to plan for media replacement as media is rapidly changing. Whatever we store content, wherever we store content, it is now going to change over time. So be aware that your choices, decisions need to be reviewed periodically and to, um, to ensure that they are meeting um, your needs. Okay. So if anybody doesn't, uh, does anybody have questions about the store module? We're going to move on to protect. If you have any questions, use the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface, and I've got that right here on the laptop. I can pass on any questions you have about what we just, uh, what Karen just talked about with the store module. You know, we're covering a lot of information very quickly, yeah. but if you have, think of anything, type it in whenever you do, even during it, like we had earlier. We don't have to wait till the end. <laughs> Yes. I'll interrupt as needed. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about protect. Um, most of the time, digital uh, digital preservation stories aren't um, all that interesting, as especially as, as like the physical ones. But the truth is, is emergencies happen in the digital world just like the physical one. And if you um, can't open a file that you need, there's a serious problem. So when we talk about digital preservation, what exactly are we protecting content from? We want to know that our um, want we want we don't know um, we don't want our files to change. We don't want them to become obsolete, and we don't want them to get into the wrong hands. Uh, we may be um, mandated to keep certain information uh, for a period of time, um, and then disasters do happen. Uh, if building housing if the building housing your fire your servers burned down um, and there's no off-site backup, then that's a serious problem. Once stored, the content needs to be protected. Um, this includes everyday concerns such as who has access and whether that file has changed, as well as emergency contingencies such as um, a business uh, uh, such as disaster planning. Um, we need to address roles and responsibilities for physical and virtual access to digital content throughout its life cycle. Um, have you ever lost content? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> ever had a close call? Uh, so uh, I'm sure all of you can probably tell some sort of horror stories. I know that um, I can. Um, Whether at work or personal. Yes, <laughs> I'm sure. Everybody's had a computer crash. It's scarier when it's the uh, the uh, the server. I, we just recently had um, one of our servers just die. I had couldn't get access to it at all, and I was freaking out because I was sure that it was something, but it ended up being just the motherboard. Yeah. So they replaced the motherboard. The, mother the, the content was fine and not damaged, but there was that few days when they were testing it that yeah. I was. I had a few sleepless nights. So, um, uh, so this. Common and often is, and is often a sensitive to do more than just uh, more about preservation, disaster planning, and business um, continuity through preservation. We do have one question yes. that came in the middle of that. Um, I want to know to clarify the main difference between backup and preservation yes. um, is the inclusion of metadata? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, and a lot of times when you do back up your files or your IT person backs up your files, what they do is they compress it. Mm -hmm, right. And we know that we don't ever want to compress our data for preservation reasons because when you compress it, you lose little bits of that information. Of the actual digital object itself. Yes, right. absolutely. Yeah. So what, what, that's, that's, the di that's the main difference. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, Day-to-day -day threats to digital content exist. Um, 
continual caution and awareness are necessary. Um, what are your policies and procedures for access to your online and offline content? Um, who has access to it? Um, and how is, it, uh, the author, uh, how is the authorization managed? Um, staffing changes. So it's important to document your policies and procedures. And um, then review current practices, access methods on a regular basis. So the um, gist of this model is that you need to be ready in case of a disaster. You need to know where your content is, who has access to it, what risks might exist to your digital content, um, and then you really need to know, need to incorporate digital content into your disaster planning. Um, I'm sure a lot of us have disaster manuals. Um, hopefully. Yes, hopefully. You definitely should. <laughs> um, uh, and and, and this, this should become part of your disaster manual, another chapter in the disaster manual. Uh, you can't wait until a disaster happens. You need to be ready. Many organizations um, only realize gaps in their readiness um, when something actually happens. Mm. Uh, I'm sure nobody was prepared for Hurricane Tr Tr Katrina, mm. for example. Um, being uh, prepared is, is good practice. It saves time and money. Readiness protects investments um, to, in digital content. We want to be able to preserve problems, and uh, to do so, it needs to. It helps that we can predict that uh, what is the most likely risks and threats to us. Uh, we also need to be able to detect errors or damage, and we need to have policy and procedures for um, response and repair of those uh, for, um, when damage and loss uh, occurs. Okay, don't get so carried away in identifying risks that you fail to identify appropriate responses to them. Um, disaster preparedness needs to focus on the response. Um, it may be helpful to think of the levels of damage and what the appropriate response is to each level. For example, you may have one set of policies and procedures for a loss or damage of a few files um, and you may set up a different procedures in the event that your server crashes or your storage media is lost. Scaling up or down, um, what, what uh, scaling up, up again, what if a hurricane or tornado wipes out uh, much of your infrastructure? Yeah. These, are, these are the things that keep us up at night, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Planning needs to be made that um, addresses different levels of scope so that you can respond appropriately and prevent loss. We do have a question that's more of a um, practical one, yes. I believe. Um, and it's related to what you were just mentioning there about yes. having figuring out what you're going to do. And the question is, is there a way to fix a damaged file? That's why you have more than one copy. Time. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, it, I think it kind of depends on what type of file yeah. it is. It's going to vary. It yeah. is going to vary. Um, but again, that's that's where that comes. We go back to the multiple copies in multiple mm -hmm. places. Um, yeah, if like say um, something that I did one time, I personally did one time, was I accidentally um, overwrote a master TIFF file. <laughs> Here I am, the person who's supposed to be in charge of the digital imaging lab, and I overwrote a master TIFF file and converted it to a low-resolution JPEG. Mm. Um, and had we not had that copy of that a copy else. of that somewhere mm. else, there was no repairing that. Right. You've, you've changed it. It's a done it's deal. It's your done yeah. deal. <laughs> there is no undo button for mm. once you hit save. Um, so it kind of depends. It's going to depend, and you might need to get a techie person, someone who's got more of that kind of yeah. knowledge than I think either of us do, who can do that, recover previous versions if that's something you've done. But really, the ultimate, it, the, what you really want to do is just have extra copies no matter what, so in case something does happen to one, either Absolutely. by accident, by, um, you know, destruction by nature or by human. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's something else you can just say, go back and get the original from somewhere else and replace it, and now you're good. And I know that that six copy sounds excessive, but there are there are instant yeah. instances where that does become very important, um, and at least two copies is is always good. Yeah. 
In physically different locations. In physically yeah. different locations. So when a tornado hits here, we still have it somewhere yeah. else. <laughs> and, you know, it doesn't have to be all, all six copies don't have to be in different locations. Mm -hmm. Like for us, we have um, the, the dueling, I'm sorry, I'm not a tech, not IT person, but the, the um, what do you call it, the, where the one, ser one um, server backs up the other server automatically. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, mirrors it. There we go. Yeah. Yes, mirror. serious, yeah, mm -hmm. mirror servers. Um, and those are in the same room, but then I have another copy in a different location mm -hmm. as well. So that, so I have at least three copies. Okay, so I hope that answers your question, but um, yeah. most of the time I get the answer from the IT person is, nope, you are got to find a new copy. <laughs> Where's your other copies? copies. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so on to um, emergency protection. Often digital content is left out of disaster planning, um, so find out what the status is for maintaining and restoring digital content in your, at your institution. It can be challenging to get people to focus on emergency planning when there isn't an emergency. But um, if they don't, when the emergency happens, it'll be too late. Make sure information about emergency response um, isn't only available online or in a digital form. Make sure that the key people can have um, access to it even if the internet access is down or um, computers are unavailable. Run through this practice scenario um, annually to make sure um, people know what to do. Um, our disaster manuals um, not only are on our desk, but several of us have them in our homes as well with the key numbers and things. And it's also available online and accessible. Um, Remember that restoring all preservation copies with, um, in some, within some days after an emergency may be uh, sufficient. Um, users will want to access restore, uh, restored right away. But preservation happens over time. It doesn't um, have to move as quickly as access does. The focus should be on ongoing updating um, planning rather than a, on a uh, producing a static disaster plan. The thing um, that sits the, the disaster plan, the, the thing that sits on a shelf in a red binder. You need a comprehensive program tailored to your institution, one that is reviewed at least annually by management and staff um, who um, management and staff who are involved. Um, think through what should be restored first. Did I go backwards? I did go backwards again. There we go. Um, think, th think through what should be restored first. Um, it's not possible to do everything at once. What is an acceptable time frame for restoring core functions, um, if possible? Minutes, days, weeks. Sometimes restoring means um, rebooting computers or servers that may have shut down abruptly. Um, sometimes it means fixing equipment and facilities before um, they can be used again. Planning should identify who's, who determines priorities in the event of an emergency and um, restoring data content should be on that list. The National Institute for Standards and Technology Guides provides us a useful um, frame work for disaster planning. And I believe that should be on the resources page that you have links to um, on, on your site. Yeah, that will be added. Um, yep. Yeah. Uh, business continua uh, uh, continuity uh, may involve such things as getting your primary website up as soon as possible. Um, a uh, business recovery plan may, uh, may be needed to specify the order in which servers or services are restored, um, how and by whom. The cyber incident reports um, plan may include your procedures for when your servers are swamped by such things as um, a denial of service attack. Um, continue out, continue it, continuity of operations um, is planning for how to keep your services going when your infrastructure has been compromised. Do you have an arrangement with a partner to um, mirror your site and bring it up um, and bring up the mirror if yours goes down? Disaster recovery is how you respond to disasters, and I do mean disasters, whether it be fire, flood, or tornadoes. 
Um, an IT contingency plan may include um, identifying sources, who, identifying services who could host your web um, access um, should your local server room be destroyed. Uh, and, an occupant, uh, and an occupant emergency plan takes into account for your staff. Do you have backup people trained to take over in event that you lose um, key personnel? Um, this di diagram distinguishes between the things that may be affected, facilities, IT, and business. Um, and the arrow map that um, planning documents to phase uh, documents to phases in an emergency um, protect, sustain, recover, and resume. Uh, training for emergencies that include what to do about digital content should be provided to all staff and emphasize with um, regular reminders. Um, there are lots of resources out there that can help. Um, no one needs to start from scratch. Uh, check out some of these disaster planning resources and select one um, for use as a model for your own um, disaster planning. Um, the Jail R4 Conservation Center um, does have um, links to disaster, a, a great disaster manual and how to set up disaster manuals. Um, but at this time, we don't have anything for digital content. But it is a good place to start for your institution. And you can build from there. So the outcomes of the protection module is that you are prepared um, should something happen to your digital content. You know who to contact. You know how to put things right. And if there's anything you can do to migrate for a great disaster, then you've already done it. All right, so that is the end of the um, store and protect. Um, March 6th, we will talk about manage and provide. Yes. So is there any questions? If you have any questions, type them into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. We have uh, at least another 10 minutes or so. We can be with those any questions, comments, thoughts, anything you want to say. Um, or we'll waiting to see if anybody does come up with anything. <laughs> um, as we said at the beginning of this, I know some people came in a late the presentation and um, documents with links to a lot more resources will be available um, when the recording goes up. Um, the first session of this three-part series that was done two weeks ago is the recording and all of its links and, and documentation is already available on our Encompass Live website. Um, that was the uh, inventory and select module. And then, as you said, in two weeks, on March 6th, you can come for the um, part three. Manage yeah. and provide. Right. Um, oh, okay, we do have a, can you flip back to the disaster plan resources a couple of slides back? Someone wants to see all yes. those logos. Yes, yeah, there you yeah. go. Um, some of the main ones uh, that are the, the Library of Congress Prevention website has um, some mm -hmm. great information, and since they're the ones who do to um, created these modules, I'm sure they have some great ones for digital content. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the North East Document Center has a wonderful one for um, for uh, physical items um, as well as digital images. Um, and another one that's not on here that I find very helpful is the um, National Park Service has a great uh, website as well with lots of um, information. Their um, conserver grams are um, amazing. So they're dealing with a lot of things out in nature, so I'm sure they've got to deal with all yes. water, fire, yeah. And flood. Yeah, <laughs> and and they've had to deal with a lot of of their sites being hit. Um, they've got sites all over the country. So they were there for Katrina. They were out mm. in um, New York for the big storm out there. Sandy. Mm, Sandy. Yeah. yeah. Um, as well as um, here in the Midwest dealing with storms and tornadoes. And um, the Beatrice one um, had flooding. Oh, wow. Um, the, the Homestead National Monument had mm -hmm. flooding, I think it was four or five years ago. So, um, but they had a disaster plan and so they, uh, they had minimum it. damage. So. <laughs> right. But you cannot predict damage. And it might be as simple as a busted pipe or a um, Right, thing. yeah. Things that you tornado. surprise, you get an email before when you come into work. Oh yeah, down in the basement the pipes burst and all those things you kept safe down there and the archived yeah. manuscripts are now soaked. What do we do? <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, sometimes it's not nature. It's just yes, yeah. yeah. Um, Any other questions for Karen while she's here today? 
And part of the um, part of the, the um, Husker Heritage Network um, is going to focus on digital planning, uh, disaster planning. So if you don't have a disaster manual in place and and um, and are now in a panic about getting one, um, please stay tuned for um, our upcoming seven, our upcoming workshops and things. Be able to help you get one together to write one up. Yes, yes. And you can always contact the Ford Center. They'd be happy to help you plan for one, too. All right. Well, it doesn't look like anyone's typing in any urgent messages at the moment, so I think we'll wrap it up for today. Thank you very much, Karen, for coming by again, even though you're sick. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. Um, got lucky and beat the... The Speaking of disasters or possible snow lizard apocalypse, whatever they want to yes. call it. We'll see what we end up with here. Yes, um, everybody go check your uh, backup servers. Yes, your, before uh, it comes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you everyone for attending this morning's session. Um, as I said, Karen will be back in two weeks, March 6th, for part three, the final part of the um, preservation uh, sessions that we're doing. But I hope so thank you for coming today, and there we go. Um, next week um, on Encompass Live, it is the last Wednesday of the month, which is uh, traditionally our Tech Talk with Michael Sowers, who is the Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Library Commission. And he has, um, he does you know, tech news of the month, any interesting things that have come up. And um, this week, he, and he also brings in guest speakers, interviews. And this month, he's got um, Matt Hamilton from the Anything Libraries in Colorado talking about their studio initiative, um, which is um, new things they're doing with digital learning and programming at the libraries in Colorado. Um, so hopefully sign up and join us for that session um, next Wednesday morning. Um, also, Encompass Live is on Facebook, so if you are a big Facebook user, and if Facebook is working, there we go. <laughs> that took a little time. Um, you can follow us on Facebook, where I announce um, any whenever new sessions have been are coming up, um, when the recordings are ready, um, and any maybe news items that might be related to any sessions that we have done. So. Um, Follow us, uh, like us on Facebook, and you can get some um, information from us there. Um, other than that, we are wrapped up for today, and I hope you'll join us next week. And I don't think we are. So thank you very much. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.